Well, thank you so much for popping into the podcast studio with me here to introduce tonight's episode of Pleasure Central Radio. Yeah, so the thing you're going to be reading today, I heard it when you sent it to me and was like, wow, this encapsulates so much of the type of things I've been thinking about. So excited to get to share a few words at the start of it. I'm excited to hear what you think. Well, the piece you've chosen today is about art and making art. And I think for me, an important thing to keep in mind when listening to this is we often have a very narrow definition of what art is. We might think it's painting or composing music. But I think there is a way to approach everything in our lives that makes everything art. There's a way to do our work, which makes our work art, whether that's writing code or building a house. And there's ways to do those things that aren't art as well. And so I think this piece really spoke to me when I listen to it or read it from the mindset of an artistic approach to doing everything that I might do in a day. Parenting, cooking, building, loving, all those things. Oh, I like loving a lot. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, coming from you, I think this means even more because... You had your very techie corporate background for a long time, and now you've stepped into this new place of entrepreneurship and creating unusual spaces for people that are entirely unique, each one on their own, but also very uh, quality and very tailored to the person's desires and their, I almost would say, like their soul's interest. (laughs) That's how I think of it. (laughs) That's how I like to think of it, too, so that's good. (laughs) Yeah, and I think even, I mean, it's more obvious to see how this might apply to some of the things I do now, building a treehouse, building a custom spot for somebody to work, things like that. But even before, I think my last couple of years in the corporate tech world were all about focusing less on the money and the career path and on creating beauty which can be creating beauty in the actual product, whether you're thinking about an end user and thinking how it's going to feel to use something that's well created, or thinking about the culture of the team that you're working in and thinking about how beautiful it is when all different types of people can come together and be heard and have input into creating a thing together. And, you know, my favorite piece of this uh, commencement speech that I'm going to be reading is it it talks about art not just as something that's pretty to be worthwhile. And I think, for me, that's the key. Like, yes, make good art. And when you're making good art, you're basically therapizing yourself. (laughs) You're, you're, You're getting therapy, art therapy in a way of some kind. Because our brains are sifting through creative processes as we're building something or drawing something or coloring in something. And I don't know. I've always found it to be really helpful to build art, to build art together. And my episode a couple of episodes ago, our Art Together Now episode, that one, I had discovered that one of my own personal, like, worst person habits can be negated or counteracted by creating art with other people. Mm. That way I'm just not tempted to do the pattern. So, yeah, I've been keeping an eye out for a lot of ways of creating art and making art and relating to art. So this is one of those ways. We're going to talk about this speech in a second. But also, I was just on somebody else's podcast, and they are a creative person. It's from The Unmistakable Creative... Had you heard about that podcast before we met? I had not. I heard about it first when you were talking about it. It's pretty cool. The host is Srini Rao, and he has a really interesting background, kind of like you and I. He's had a very techie background, but also decided he wanted to be a surfer and just surf. (laughs) So he created a lifestyle where he could surf and blog and has a podcast now. It's a big podcast. It's got a huge archive and some people have been on there that I really respect and I got to be on there. So you should probably tell us what your episode is called so that we can go find it. 
Yes, it is the April 7th, 2021 episode, which just happens to be my birthday. How cool was that? Shrini, very cool. Shrini did not know it was my birthday when he published it. But uh, yeah, I had a nice birthday surprise that morning when a friend texted me that it was out. <laughs> um, it is a professional courtesan's guide to intimacy and connection. And like all podcasts, you can find that anywhere that good podcasts are found. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes. (laughs) One of the reasons I wanted to bring this up, though, is that Srini has also created a Mighty Networks community. He has a community called the Unmistakable Creative for people that consider themselves to be creatives. So they're often creatives in unusual ways and unusual places, but they get together online to do creative projects and to support and encourage each other. And it's a pretty cool place. I think one other thing that stands out to me from this speech is the idea that it's good to do a lot of things and to be okay with failure. That's something that, you know, for all of the the toxic things in the tech industry, I think that's one thing the tech industry does really well, especially in startup land. The idea that just because something fails doesn't mean you failed. It's okay to try a lot of things and some of them are going to work and that's great and by nature some of them are going to fail and that's also fine and so I I really love this idea of do a whole bunch of different things send out a whole bunch of different bottles see what see what lands somewhere and a lot of it's going to be lost and the more you do the less those failures are going to hurt because you have a lot of other projects that you're working on as well That sounds a lot like why I like polyamory. (laughs) (laughs) Right? I mean, it's not that your friends or family are too busy for you. It's more like, you know, you you make different kinds of connections with different people. And so this way there's a very robust safety net around you. And you can create those deep connections with a wide variety. Wow, that's interesting. So maybe taking that where you wouldn't classify a necessarily a relationship in polyamory world as success or failure. In fact, you get to move away from that because you're no longer in a relationship if it doesn't turn into the one, then that's failure. Yes. You get to just let each relationship be what it is. Maybe that's a great thing to bring to work as well, where just because something doesn't turn into a million dollar business does not mean it's a failure. It's good to have some things that make you money. It's also good to have some things that are fun. And maybe they're the same thing, or maybe they're different. The more things you do, you get to meet those different wants and desires in different ways. And when you look at it that way, it becomes less of a, my creativity is something that's going to fund my life need, and more of a, my creativity is something that is helping me expand as a person and who knows where to lead kind Mm -hmm. of attitude. That is pretty different. I like that. Well stated. Shall I read the speech? Yeah, let's get into it. All right, here goes. I found this really cool Neil Gaiman speech, and it was a commencement address on May 17th of 2012 at the University of the Arts. One more thing. I want to dedicate this episode to my older brother, Danny the artist in the family. He's always been creating and making something. My entire life, he's had some kind of project that he was building, some way of bringing beauty into the world with his own hands. Here it is, the transcript of Neil Gaiman. Make good art. I never really expected to find myself giving advice to people graduating from an establishment of higher education. I never graduated from any such establishment. I never even started at one. I escaped from school as soon as I could, when the prospect of four more years of enforced learning before I'd become the writer I wanted to be was stifling. I got out into the world, I wrote, and I became a better writer the more I wrote. And I wrote some more, and nobody ever seemed to mind that I was making it up as I went along. They just read what I wrote and paid for it, or they didn't, and often they commissioned me to write something else for them which has left me with a healthy respect and fondness for higher education that those of my friends and family who attended universities were cured of long ago. Looking back, I've had a remarkable ride, 
I'm not sure I can call it a career because a career implies that I had some kind of career plan and I never did. <laughs> the nearest thing I had was a list I made when I was 15 of everything I wanted to do. Write an adult novel, a children's book, a comic, a movie, record an audiobook, write an episode of Doctor Who, and so on. I didn't have a career, just the next thing on the list. So I thought I'd tell you everything I wish I'd known starting out, and a few things that, looking back on it, I suppose I did know, and that I would also give you the best piece of advice I'd ever got, which I completely failed to follow. First of all, when you start out on a career in the arts, you have no idea what you were doing. And this is great. People who know what they are doing know the rules and know what is possible and impossible. You do not, and you should not. The rules on what is possible and impossible in the arts were made by people who had not tested the bounds of the possible by going beyond them. And you can. If you don't know it's impossible, it's easier to do. And because nobody's done it before, they haven't made up rules to stop anyone doing that again yet. Secondly, if you have an idea of what you want to make, what you were put here to do, then just go and do that. And that's much harder than it sounds, and sometimes, in the end, so much easier than you might imagine. Because normally, there are things that you have to do before you can get to the place you want to be. I wanted to write comics and novels and stories and films. So I became a journalist, because journalists are allowed to ask questions and to simply go and find out how the world works. And besides, to do those things, I needed to write and to write well. And I was being paid to learn how to write economically, crisply, sometimes under adverse conditions and on time. Sometimes the way to do what you hope you to do will be clear cut. And sometimes it will be almost impossible to decide whether or not you are doing the correct thing. Because you'll have to balance your goals and hopes with feeding yourself, paying debts, finding work, settling for what you can get. Something that worked for me was imagining that where I wanted to be, an author, primarily a fiction, making good books, making good comics, and supporting myself through my words, was a mountain. A distant mountain. My goal. And I knew that as long as I kept walking towards the mountain, I would be all right. And when I truly was not sure what to do, I could stop and think about whether it was taking me away from or towards the mountain. I said no to editorial jobs on magazines, proper jobs that would have paid proper money, because I knew that, attractive though they were, for me they would have been walking away from the mountain. And if those job offers had come along earlier, I might have taken them, because they still would have been closer to the mountain than I was at that time. I learned to write by writing. I tended to do anything as long as it felt like an adventure, and to stop when it felt like work, which meant that life did not feel like work. Thirdly, when you start off, you have to deal with the problems of failure. You need to be thick-skinned to learn that not every project will survive. A freelance life, a life in the arts, is sometimes like putting messages in bottles on a desert island and hoping that someone will find one of your bottles and open it and read it, and put something in a bottle that will wash its way back to you. Appreciation, or a commission, or money, or love. And you have to accept that you may put out a hundred things in a bottle for everything that winds up coming back. The problems of failure are problems of discouragement, of hopelessness, of hunger. You want everything to happen and you want it now and things go wrong. My first book, a piece of journalism I had done for the money and which had already bought me an electric typewriter from the advance, should have been a bestseller. It should have made me a lot of money. If the publisher hadn't gone into involuntary liquidation between the first print run selling out and the second printing, before any royalties could be paid, it would have done. And I shrugged, and I still had my electric typewriter and enough money to pay the rent for a couple of months, and I decided that I would do my best in the future not to write books just for the money. If you didn't get the money, then you didn't have anything. If I did work I was proud of and I didn't get the money, at least I'd have the work. Every now and again, I forget that rule, and whenever I do, the universe kicks me hard and reminds me. I don't know if that's an issue for anybody but me, but it's true that nothing I did but the only reason for doing it was the money was ever worth it, except as bitter experience. Usually, I didn't wind up getting the money either. 
The things I did because I was excited and wanted to see them exist in reality have never let me down, and I've never regretted the time I spent on any of them. The problems of failure are hard. The problems of success can be harder because nobody warns you about them. The first problem of any kind of even limited success is the unshakable conviction that you are getting away with something and that any moment now they will discover you. It's imposter syndrome, something my wife Amanda christened the fraud police. In my case, I was convinced that there would be a knock on the door and a man with a clipboard, I don't know why he carried a clipboard in my head, but he did, would be there to tell me it was all over and they had caught up with me. And now I would have to go and get a real job, one that didn't consist of making things up and writing them down and reading books I wanted to read. And then I would go away quietly and get the kind of job where you don't have to make things up anymore. The problems of success, they're real and with luck, you'll experience them. The point where you stop saying yes to everything because now the bottles you threw in the ocean are coming back and have to learn to say no. I watched my peers and my friends and the ones who were older than me and watch how miserable some of them were. I'd listen to them telling me that they couldn't envisage a world where they did what they had always wanted to do anymore because now they had to earn a certain amount every month just to keep where they were. They couldn't go and do the things that mattered and that they had really wanted to do and that seemed as big a tragedy as any problem of failure. And after that, the biggest problem of success is that the world conspires to stop you doing the thing that you do because you are successful. There was a day when I looked up and realized that I had become someone who professionally replied to email and wrote as a hobby. I started answering fewer emails and was relieved to find that I was writing much more. Fourthly, I hope you'll make mistakes. If you're making mistakes, it means you're out there doing something. And the mistakes in themselves can be useful. I once misspelled Caroline in a letter transposing the A and the O, and I thought, Coraline that looks like a real name. And remember that whatever discipline you are in, whether you are a musician or a photographer, a fine artist or a cartoonist, a writer, a dancer, a designer, whatever you do, you have one thing that's unique. You have the ability to make art. And for me, and for so many of the people I have known, that has been a lifesaver. The ultimate lifesaver. It gets you through good times and it gets you through the other ones. Life is sometimes hard. Things go wrong in life and in love and in business and in friendship and in health and in all of the other ways that life can go wrong. And when things get tough, this is what you should do. Make good art. I'm serious. Husband runs off with a politician? Make good art. Leg crushed and then eaten by mutated boa constrictor? Make good art. IRS on your trail? Make good art. Cat exploded? Make good art. Somebody on the internet thinks that what you do is stupid or evil or it's all been done before? Make good art. Probably things will work out somehow, and eventually time will take the sting away. But that doesn't matter. Do what only you do best. Make good art. Make it on the good days, too. And fifthly, while you are at it, make your art. Do the stuff that only you can do. The urge, starting out, is to copy. And that's not a bad thing. Most of us only find our own voices after we've sounded like a lot of other people. But the one thing that you have that nobody else has is you. Your voice, your mind, your story, your vision. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. The moment that you feel that, just possibly, you're walking down the street naked, exposing too much of your heart and your mind and what exists on the inside, showing too much of yourself, that's the moment you may be starting to get it right. The things that I've done that worked the best were the things I was the least certain about. The stories where I was sure they would either work or would likely be the kinds of embarrassing failures people would gather together and talk about until the end of time. They always had that in common. Looking back at them, people explain why they were inevitable successes. While I was doing them, I had no idea. 
I still don't. And where would be the fun in making something you knew was going to work? Sometimes the things I did really didn't work. There are stories of mine that have never been reprinted. Some of them never even left the house. But I learned as much from them as I did from the things that did work. Sixthly, I will pass on some secret freelancer knowledge. Secret knowledge is always good, and it is useful for anyone who ever plans to create art for other people to enter a freelance world of any kind. I learned it in comics, but it applies to other fields too. And it's this. People get hired because somehow they get hired. In my case, I did something which these days would be easy to check and would get me into trouble. And when I started out in those pre-internet days, it seemed like a sensible career strategy. When I was asked by editors who I had worked for, I lied. I listed a handful of magazines that sounded likely, and I sounded confident, and I got jobs. I then made it a point of honor to have written something for each of the magazines I'd listed to get that first job so that I hadn't actually lied, I'd just been chronologically challenged. You get work how you get work. People keep working in a freelance world, and more and more of today's world is freelance because their work is good, and because they are easy to get along with, and because they deliver the work on time. And you don't even need all three. Two out of three is fine. People will tolerate how unpleasant you are if your work is good and you deliver it on time. They'll forgive the lateness of the work if it's good and if they like you. And you don't have to be as good as the others if you're on time and it's always a pleasure to hear from you. When I agreed to give this address, I started trying to think what the best advice I'd been given over the years was. And it came from Stephen King, 20 years ago, at the height of the success of Sandman. I was writing a comic that people loved and were taking seriously. King had liked Sandman and my novel with Terry Pratchett, Good Omens, and he saw the madness, the long signing lines, all that, and his advice was this. This is really great. You should enjoy it. And I didn't. Best advice I got that I ignored. Instead, I worried about it. I worried about the next deadline, the next idea, the next story. There wasn't a moment for the next 14 or 15 years that I wasn't writing something in my head or wondering about it. And I didn't stop and look around and go, this is really fun. I wish I'd enjoyed it more. It's been an amazing ride, but there were parts of the ride I missed because I was too worried about things going wrong, about what came next to enjoy the bit I was on. That was the hardest lesson for me, I think, to let go and enjoy the ride, because the ride takes you to some remarkable and unexpected places. And here on this platform today is one of those places. I am enjoying myself immensely. To all today's graduates, I wish you luck. Luck is useful. Often you will discover that the harder you work and the more wisely you work, the luckier you get. But there is luck and it helps. We are in a transitional world right now. If you're in any kind of artistic field, because the nature of distribution is changing, the models by which creators get their work out into the world and got to keep a roof over their heads and buy sandwiches while they did it, all are changing. I've talked to people at the top of the food chain in publishing, in book selling, in all of those areas, and nobody knows what the landscape will look like two years from now, let alone a decade from now. The distribution channels that people had built over the last century or so are in flux for print, for visual artists, for musicians, for creative people of all kinds, which is, on the one hand, intimidating, and on the other hand, immensely liberating. The rules, the assumptions, the now we're supposed to's of how to get your work seen and what you do then are breaking down. The gatekeepers are leaving their gates. You can be as creative as you need to be to get your work seen. YouTube and the web, and whatever comes after YouTube and the web, can give you more people watching than televisions ever did. The old rules are crumbling and nobody knows what the new rules are. So make up your own rules. Someone asked me recently how to do something she thought was going to be difficult, in this case, recording an audiobook, and I suggested she pretend that she was someone who could do it. Not pretend to do it, but pretend she was someone who could. She put up a notice to this effect on the studio wall, and she said it helped. So be wise, because the world needs more wisdom. And if you cannot be wise, pretend to be someone who is wise, and then just behave like they would. And now go. 
and make interesting mistakes. Make amazing mistakes. Make glorious and fantastic mistakes. Break the rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. And make good art. Thanks for listening to Pleasure Central Radio, hosted by me, Rebecca Beltran. Today's guest was Rowan. My featured art today came from Neil Gaiman. Technical production was by me. I get significant creative feedback from my beta listeners group. For this episode, special thanks goes to Tom and to Sam. I look forward to your company on the next episode. Hey, Pleasure Seeker. Well, that's it for today's conversation. Here at Pleasure Central Radio, we love using conscious communication, science geekery, and copious amounts of true pleasure to improve our partnerships, our money, and our love lives. And we hope you do too. If you loved what you heard here, we'd love a review. You can listen to other episodes of the podcast and read thought-provoking essays or poems written by me, Radiant Rebecca, by checking out the blog on PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Sign up to hear about new episodes immediately at PleasureCentralPodcast.com. Your thought to ponder today is... Most of us only find our own voices after we've sounded like a lot of other people. But the one thing that you have that nobody else has is you. Your voice, your mind, your story, your vision... So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. The moment that you feel that, just possibly, you're walking down the street naked, exposing too much of your heart and your mind and what exists on the inside, showing too much of yourself, that's the moment you may be starting to get it right.